Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Colin, Colin Geller, uh, senior concept artist at id Software. Uh, I've been there for almost seven years, and I've been working in the industry for about 12. Um, I'm going to figure out how to screen share real quick, and then we're going to get this started. So, OK, um, I'm just going to go over a couple things uh, very high level in the beginning and very quickly. And then I'm going to kind of go into a little bit of a deep dive in the amount of time that I have, uh, which will hopefully be around 15 minutes unless I go over and someone can flag me down. Um, so essentially, uh, early on in development, um, uh, I believe that we had decided that one of the places we were going to go was hell on earth. And even before necessarily we had finalized, I guess, ideas for what that level would be, we did start some previs. So uh, I had an opportunity as well as some of the other guys to kind of do some high level uh, blue sky on what hell on earth could be. Uh, during this time and afterwards, we kind of started developing the core elements of the levels. One of them would ultimately become uh, in the game if you had a chance to play it, uh, which is called Super Gore Nest, where there's a giant gore nest uh, that's spread throughout this city and you need to go slay all the demons. Uh, sometime after this, we did uh, a series of iterations on what this could be. Uh, this was kind of me going a little ham, thinking like, oh, how extreme could we make it? Let's, you know, how hellified could we make it? Uh, in this instance, I believe, if I remember correctly, this was a little, a little too hellish and became less relatable. And on a side note, the scale may have been a little unachievable. After a series of variations on this, uh, we kind of wound up at this image, which more or less was for a vista that we knew that we were going to have in the level, but also helped establish uh, a lot of the atmospherics, uh, an atmosphere that we would see in the this level and then additional hell levels. Now, during this time, uh, I believe Alex was also working on Super Gornes concepts, so we were keying off of what he was doing. Uh, the 3D art team was working on ideas and as well as the, the Skybox team. And then after this phase, um, you know, it, the, the game doesn't 100% look like the concept art, but you go through a series of iterations and working closely with the team. And one of my favorite aspects of working in game development is working with the team. So they would take this, work on a skybox uh, for the game, and then sometimes we would get those kicked back for additional paint overs. Now, not as necessarily as much time was spent on this, but this is kind of deeper in the production, and it kind of shows how we're, we're very collaborative and working uh, as a team. And I believe Ryan Watkins, our uh, Skybox lead, uh, he really hit this one out of the park and did a really phenomenal job. And I believe this premiered originally during our 2018 QuakeCon gameplay preview, uh, where you got kind of a cool cinematic look uh, at this Vista. Now, if you had a chance to play the game, uh, this is very on, early on in the level. So if you haven't played it yet, you should totally go check it out. So the one of the other uh, exciting things about working in game development and concept design is there's a huge variety of things you get to work on. So in addition to working on things like uh, this environment and other environments, um, I had an opportunity to work on a rocket launcher. For me personally, this was really exciting because this was the first mainstream or main campaign weapon I had an opportunity to work on for Doom. And I've always loved the weapons in Doom and other games. And, and I've always felt there's a great character in essentially a first person shooter because that's what you are. That's what you're seeing. Now you are the Doom Slayer, but you're attacking things with the weapon. So uh, we were looking at Doom 2016 weapon, which is an awesome weapon designed by Brian Flynn. Uh, and it uh, we to get into the um, into the next game and explore how we could expand on its style choices and, and see what we were going to do with it, essentially. And one of the things that came up, I believe Hugo had mentioned, looking at the original uh, rocket launcher from the first Doom uh, and maybe ways we could bring in elements of that. And then another element that uh, is a big part of this weapon is that we decided that it would be in the cultist style, which is a new style that uh, John Lane uh, had really champion the design language on. And then these are some screenshots from the game itself uh, on the right side of the screen. And then on the left, you see the UAC Mars kind of architecture that really influenced the design of the rocket launcher, 
I mean, granted, the rocket launcher was done, I believe, around the same time uh, as those, but it was a, a big push and pull in making sure that when you're designing a weapon, it sticks within that world. Now for Doom, we wanted to, uh, as, as we were taking uh, the rocket launcher into this cultist style, we really wanted to kind of pull direct elements from the, the architecture that was established. Uh, and that was a really exciting uh, challenge. So during the process, uh, this is kind of where we started. Um, I had an opportunity to do a series of sketches. Uh, I think some of them were already hitting on a, in a good note. Like this is relatively similar. There's a lot of similar design elements that we wind up going with. This was way too Darth Vader. I don't know if you can see the Star Wars, but I'm hugely influenced with that, which is also not a good thing. But that's part of the challenge of this is how do we push and pull uh, weapons like this into a direction that isn't just making a cool gun, but advancing the visual design and taking the language that's, that's available. So there's, there's, this is over the course of a series of weeks, there's a back and forth collaboration between me, uh, Hugo, uh, the other concept designers on the team, John Lane, uh, Peter Sokol, who I believe is our weapons uh, systems lead. I actually don't remember his title exactly, but um, we work very closely together as a team. So we're not in a little box uh, kind of inner corner, we're working together. And that's a really exciting and challenging process. Um, and you can see here, we were kind of implementing more of the, the skull motifs that appear in uh, the uh, um, cultist architecture. And that, I mean, this is such a metal uh, design language and it's so different from 2016's uh, kind of Mars core or Mars Earth, human Mars kind of architecture from the UAC that you see uh, throughout the Doom 2016. And uh, this, this was just a really exciting project to be a part of. Um, uh, and then kind of, again, there were a series of iterations on this. Um, and at one point I did block out a 3D model to make sure that my first person view was more accurate than these. So I'm just gonna go back real quick. And the, one of the reasons why that's important is because we need to get a good sense of what this looks like before anyone puts hundreds of man hours into modeling it, because it's much cheaper to do the concept. So this is the opportunity we have and the time we have to kind of go back and forth and iterate. And this was just a really kind of awesome, awesome experience for me. Um, and then once we get this done, part of the charm of the Doom weapons is we have the mod system. So you can swap in and out of uh, different mods for several weapons. So in this, this was the lock-on mod. And if you've played the game, it's very exciting. It locks on rockets, so you can shoot like three rockets at a demon hiding around a corner if you catch him before he goes there. But even with this, we're not just kind of recreating what's there, but changing a little bit. We're trying to give it its own visual story. And there's secondary movement in here, like these kind of move in and out. And that kind of adds to the focus that we have on every individual element. I mean, so much time and effort goes into these weapons because there's there's a handful of weapons that are designed so supremely for the, the Doom game. Uh, and again, it's very exciting. And then here, we're taking different architectural elements, in this case, the chain, uh, and kind of adding that as a secondary motif to this, which was the remote detonation mod. Now, visually, there may not be as much that says this is a remote detonation mod, but it was a really great opportunity to add something very different to the gun, uh, which is really exciting. Um, and uh, so with this, one of the other exciting challenges of working on a game like this, this isn't just making the same gun style or the same design language over and over again. You need to expand on it. And we pull from a lot of other elements uh, in the game when we're doing that. And then during the decision-making process, for example, we were like, okay, well, there is a hell, there's a war on earth. So maybe at one point there were um, human Marines or something that had like earth weapons, essentially. They're separate from the UAC, which is another earth-based organization. So then how do we kind of get in and do architecture or design changes on that? And obviously we had really great work from Emerson. He did a lot of really cool mechs and other elements for the hell on earth and then elements that John had worked on. So we kind of pulled from those and got to this, which again, there was a huge amount of work before this point, but I'm just truncating the whole idea just to cover the high level things here. But again, 
This one, um, earth focused, much more mechanically relatable, whereas the rocket launcher still had elements like you can see, you know, essentially you're, you're seeing the, the action of the, the rockets being entered into the chamber to be shot and you get this kind of cool visual secondary language of this rocket flaring every time you shoot, but from an actual practical standpoint, you'd probably die if you were holding this thing, although the Doom Marine wouldn't because he's a badass. But this is a much more relatable kind of human uh, weapon. We wanted to make it a little bit more advanced than a weapon you might find in another popular military shooter, uh, so something that's still very unique. Uh, and then you take it to the opposite extreme and you key off of, say, the ERDAC language, which, uh, again, Emerson pioneered. Um, and uh, that was a really exciting challenge to bring not only a new design language to the weapons, but something that was really just completely new to the, the another element that was new to the, the Doom franchise and key back to a classic weapon from Doom 64, which was their Unmaker. So this weapon was a really exciting design challenge where we're taking elements from um, uh, taking elements from the original Doom 64 weapon with its kind of wrapping uh, rib cage sort of motif and then kind of really giving it this new alien-ish, is in just aliens in general, not the specific franchise, um, kind of look and feel to a weapon that you are going to pick up and hold. So again, the rocket launcher had mechanical elements that were relatable and uh, the heavy cannon had more real world elements that were relatable, but this kind of was a really exciting reach into what we could do and what it could be like. And there's a really uh, exciting uh, kind of design process for this as well. Um, but those are, those are actually all of my slides. I got through them and that I'm just talking now. Yeah, thank you, that was excellent. <laughs> but yeah, so that, that's kind of my, some elements that I was really uh, proud of to be a part of in, in this team. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing actually what the other guys have to say. Awesome, thanks. Well, I'm here by the way, sorry I'm late. Hi Hugo, wait, is that Hugo? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's Hugo. Hi everybody. Hello, thanks for joining us. No problem, excited to be here. Uh, who is the next presenter? It's Alex. Uh, Alex is going after Colin. Can you hear me? Yep. All right, cool. Can you, am I on? Or, yeah. Yes, yes, you're I on. Just, <laughs> I just see Emerson on the main screen. I'm confused. Oh, <laughs> Okay. Do I start screen share or? Yeah, you should be able to. All right. All right. So I'm just going to go over a few things, not a few things. Actually, I dropped in a bunch of things. I thought I thought I was going to have a, less things, but I, I do have many things to show. Let me see. Let me just get this screen share. Cool. Yeah, definitely. We got, we have time. We'd love to see whatever you want to show us. All right. Let me see. Is yep. We see it. Is now. it popping up? Yep. I I can't really tell what's showing. All right. What do you see? I'm not sure. All right. Yeah. Now now we see it. What do you see? Uh, we see your uh, Doom, Doom Marine. Uh, oh, okay, concept. good. Yeah. It's hard. I, it doesn't even have an outline, so I can't. I don't even know. Okay, I'm just gonna scroll. But you see the next one? Can you make that full screen? Yeah, we we can see it, Alex. Just make it full oh. screen. Um, okay. Oh, I think it's sharing the whole screen, right? Yep. Oh, okay, I gotcha. All right, so uh, as you can see, I kind of wanted to get a little bit more into this guy before showing the whole image. And what I wanted to talk about was more than just the visual, is the, the process that it took to 
come up with this final image or this isn't final but there's just this final look and there's a lot there's a lot that goes into building these characters and in and this guy in this particular uh I actually, I, I believe I misinterpreted the task at first. I, I believe it was, um, I think I was supposed to just make some changes to the to the 2016 Slayer. And I I did make some, I, I don't have any here to show because I didn't send, I didn't get approval for those, but that's just because I didn't want to show them. But I did have some other ideations of this guy that were just in the very beginning, they were just too far off from the, um, what we have already made an iconic look on the 2016. So one of the things Hugo said, he's like, hey, we, he's not opposed to changing it, but he just really wants to retain that, that uh, look that we already established. And I said, okay. So I think during that time I was going through some surgery. Uh, I had a surgery and I had a, like about a few, a week or so to think about it. So instead of just showing options, I really just try to encapsulate everything that we know what doom is, which is heavy metal, which is, you know, it's uh, blood and guts, it's just guns, it's a uh, rip and tear. Uh, so I try to take all of that and encapsulate it into one at, at the same time, sort of trying to retain what Hugo made in this Slayer, uh, 2016 and also add on to that and this is what i uh we came up with and uh yeah i was i i wasn't sure if they were gonna like it or not but they, they did they liked it so and i was happy for it and it's not i didn't want to change it just to change it i just wanted to add something new to visually new that i can say is mine as well so this is what i ended up with and but it did take a lot of um a lot of sketches just to end up here. And a lot of those sketches were unfinished. And that's the reason why I'm not showing them. That's the reason why I didn't send them to try to get them approved to show. It was all just to try to make one image, which is this one. And as you can see here, I did use, I try to get the, the old, the the OG uh, Doom guy that we know and this Doom Slayer and try to mix them up, smash them up into one. At the same time, adding you know a little bit of um, what I felt sort of like a road warrior look, um, post-apocalyptic style feel. So it's like more like an earthbound look rather than a space feel. Here's some options. I think along the way there, we we talked a lot about um, wanting to expose his biceps again you know, uh, hindsight 2020, we should have did that to begin with, to be honest, uh, because it's one of the, the hallmark, uh, trademarks of the character. And so as you see in those sketches, they're getting his biceps out is it, just a, like a return to what makes doom guy, doom guy. Yeah. And I, I'm all, I'm all for that too. Uh, like anything, um, that we can just do throwbacks, you know, any tasks that I love those, I love those tasks. Um, here's a little mock-up. Um, so since we did open up to, uh, you know, maybe adding some new design features to this guy, we we really opened up. We're like, well, what else can we add that's going to make him badass? And we did um, think of a lot of movies that you guys know, you know, like Predator, you know, Terminator, all those old school 80s action movie films, you know, Rambo, you know, exposed biceps, pecs, or abs, whatever, <laughs> just to get you that feel that he's a badass. We we did um, incorporate them with uh, that blade right there as well, and that to me that's very very new. Um, and just the way it works, I think it's awesome, and I'm I'm really happy that uh, you know they they you know it you know the top guys they're not scared to try anything new as long as it's really cool. That's what's that's what's really kick ass about working at it. Here's some more art to show for the. Grenade launcher, some of, some of the options. Um, yeah, this is just what it came down to at the very end. And here's the final look for this guy. So that was it for the Slayer. Um, you know, I threw this image just for fun. Well, it's a it's a really important image, Alex. That really defines yeah, a but... lot of stuff for us. You know, it was a great, inspiring piece of image. Uh, you know, uh, concept artist for all you guys listening. 
you know, one image can, can influence a project. And, and these guys have all uh, played a part in that. They've all made many images, more than just one. Um, and this is certainly one of them, you know, really captures the essence of, uh, of what, what it is we're trying to make. And honestly, where we're headed, uh, it's a great painting. Cool. Yeah. This, um, I love, I love working on characters, but, uh, even working here at Ed, I've, I've gone to, um, get my hands on working on environment and even more so, uh, something that I, I never really thought I'd ever work on is like illustration. I always lo loved illustrating, but, um, working at Ed, it, it, they've kind of opened, opened up a way for me to explore that area too, as an illustrator. And that's something that I, I'm going to take take to heart. <laughs> so for the next, um, I'm just showing pretty much image. I just dumped all these things in a folder and try to organize them. But this guy is a hell priest. And these, these, some of these are the ideations that I came up with. And um, I think we ended up, we ended up going with number four and yeah, the look of this guy is supposed to be a uh, very, you know, like a, what do you call it? Like a, what's that word? Kind of slimy like a very slimy uh, like a politician yeah so some of the props that he has on him i think help helped out uh decide the factor on this guy i mean some of the guys are probably they just maybe didn't work in terms of gameplay well or, in 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 the case of uh the hell priests they're they're triplets so they uh which we didn't actually get into the lore but that is what they are and um so if they became so unique as some of the the one the second and third one there uh it, they don't work as much when they're kind of three of them hunched over like that with the exact same props and the exact same pose um but that's not to say that they couldn't show up at some point uh in some future doom experience but um these guys are are, are all so cool yeah that's that's the fun part about working on ideation process you can just sort of be free to like just express your thoughts and ideas but you do have to kind of go into it knowing that you know maybe your your favorite idea might not be chosen and it's okay you know it'll still be awesome and uh here's the final i mean i like how they turned out i think they're great very brutal look to them uh, i i'm pretty happy how these guys turned out we ended up putting um a bit more color into them that guy was so cool a bit more color into them. Alex did another pass where they got just to kind of like separate them yeah. from uh, more conventional, you know, like Lord of the Rings stuff. Yeah. So th at this point, they were a bit of a Lord of the Rings, and I think to to I think uh, what the next tax was um, was probably was to explore color, but also to explore how they look like when they were before they became hellish. And uh, that's what these guys were for. And this is when we, I think you realize, you go like, yeah, maybe these guys are way too desaturated. They need to, we need to add some color into these guys. And I did do some explorations um, to see how they, they could have looked before. And uh, this was an interesting process. It was, uh, be, the reason why is because I was not used to adding color to sections that I didn't think need color. So, and, and that way, kind of, I had to like reinvent myself, reinvent my way of thinking when it came to these guys in color. Well, we ended up in a very interesting uh, spot with these guys. And this is sort of how they looked uh, sort of before they were hellish, like very sort of still having that uh, heavy metal vibe to them. Very brutal look as well. I love these. Yeah, so a little bit more. I, I'll try to go faster. I, <laughs> uh, just to show you a little bit more, this guy was really fun. Um, sometimes you get those characters that are like, uh, for me, I just can't wait to dive into them. And this guy was one of them. Um, yeah, I couldn't wait just to get this guy going. He's gone, his arm. I had to do some call outs for the modelers. Yeah, and, uh, I I love this guy. This is one of those tasks that I just I just love. I like, I can't wait to get my hands on. Um, and this this guy is OG as well. Um, and I try to do it justice. And and the whole process of this guy was just fun. Um, here's the armored version. 
Let me see what's next. Um, I just threw in some gargoyle images as well. Yeah, the the idea with this guy was like a winged creature, you know, and it can be whatever. You can have some cybernetic parts to them or or not. Um, but here were some ideations that uh, I created. But can you the, can you zoom in on one of those, Alex? One of those pens? Yeah, zoom yeah. in on one of those. Let me see if I can. Yeah, the one on the left. I don't know if I can. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, hold on. I have to double click it, I think. Okay. This guy? Oh. What's going on? Okay. You can scroll the bar over. Yeah, look at all that cool. Go even closer. Let's expose it all. Yeah, I'm not I'm not used to this these zoom calls, so I'm trying to <laughs> Look how look how fantastic that looks. The 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 technique was really easy too. Like um like any almost I feel like anyone can do this. Um it was just sort of it was very fun. We try um, to let our like our concept guys uh, certainly you know use 3D as needed but more as a tool not uh we're we're a little bit traditional in that way that like Alex as you see all the concept guys you know, using um, a lot of illustration techniques um, to execute on the idea. So that way, when we hand it over to the character modelers, you know, there's, there's, uh, they're still going to work it out uh, in their sculpts. So, and I think it makes it an enjoyable process for them. Certainly uh, as needed for you young concept artists out there, you should absolutely use 3D when you need to. Like there's no need to be blocking out perspective when you've got 3D programs to do that. But I mean, I, I don't think that 3D will ever replace this i mean alex can do these crazy fast and um hopefully some of the other guys i saw collins like you see i mean this is the meat and potatoes of being a concept artist i know a lot of people who come to these they're they're aspiring concept artists like the the sexy zbrush stuff is really awesome but but like you you got to be able to do this and do this fast and and alex can crank these out you know all day uh and and they really allow us to work through so many iterations. Any one of these could have been awesome, you know? Um, so it's a, it's a, probably what you're looking at here is one of the most important skills that a concept artist can have when they're, when they're looking to land their first job. Nice. Uh, man, I wish I could know what screen is. Okay. Oh, all right. Back to it. Yeah, so we ended up with this look. It's really cool. Um, right here. Uh, this is what we ended up before the final. We did. Uh, we do make some additional changes if need be. Um, and I think uh, what we made was just uh, like a texture variant on this guy, and a bit of a different paint over. Um, but that was it, I believe. And here's here's this guy. This guy is. Uh, and I mean, these, these drawings, as I see them, I think of them sort of like, um, they just, it, it's a design. It's not always pretty, but it just shows, um, I guess it shows the character and the details enough um, of the details for a character modeler to go off of. And uh, I mean, I wish I could have done a crazier illustration of this guy, but it is what it is. And um, to be honest, it, it, it does enough to, for the modeler to know exactly what they need to do. But if they don't, I, I can come in and help them out with the with some uh, paint overs. But in terms of character, I think it's spot on. Like you look at this thing and this thing looks crazy. Like, uh, and it, it also, it it gets that, um, gives you that that doom vibe as well. That That's something we always look for. Okay, I'll try to go a little faster. Here's this this uh, this girl, <laughs> con maker. She was she was interesting too. Uh, here's with the wings. With with these guys, um, you can tell that I use. Um, I mean, if you looked at it, the, all the other drawings I showed, um, I, it's almost like every character I, I use almost a different technique, um, and that. You know that goes to as well, like uh, Hugo, as you were saying, to all the the young artists. Like, how, it's not bad if you try to explore different techniques, because sometimes a technique can help you solve a problem. 
And for this for this lady, um, I did have it, it has a lot more subtle features than the other more egregious designs, and I did have to sort of change my technique to accomplish this look more into a soft brush look. And it, I mean, the technique really helped me out. It makes it can make a difference. So I would encourage every young artist to you know explore as many techniques as you can. It is just going to make you um, more versatile when you go out in the field and try to find jobs. Okay, and I think for the, here's some more guys. And um, yeah, here's different, these two different, I love this guy. Um, this guy was also like super fun to work on. Um, yeah, every time I get like these retro look looking uh, characters, I really, I really like to get into them. Here, I'll do more. Okay, um, and here's the last thing. Uh, so I just really started getting into this in Doom Eternal. Um, I did have a hand in it, like on uh, the Doom 2016. And these were, uh, this was doing cover art and I've never really done cover art before, but and I was tasked to do some of these, which made me really happy. And um, I did have to explore what our new, cover would look like and these were thumbnails i do these uh i do many of these this, this is actually a small portion but i do do many of these before ending up with the cover and this is a process that we, i usually do with thumbnails and after thumbnails i graduate them to a little bit of color and then uh after this gets approved i do try to tighten it up a little bit more to be a little bit more secure about it so we go full confident uh, when it comes to the full render. And I mean, you guys have probably seen these um, illustrations before, but that's that's the process. It's it's uh, a lot of sketches for these guys. I think I, I spend a lot more time doing these sketches than I probably do painting this. Um, maybe, um, maybe half and half. I'm not sure, but I do spend a ton because we want to get it right. We want to get every little thing right. And um, well, yeah. the the, re the reason for that too, for, for all the young concept artists listening, is that um, when you get to this image, what he's showing here, there's a tremendous amount of work spent rendering it. But we can't we can't be making wholesale changes at this point. They they become very like. The further and further you go along in the process, the more expensive the changes become. So Alex's process uh, is is set up in a way that it's easier. We do a lot of iterations, make all the major decisions in the sketches and the color blockouts and the color comps. So that way, when we once we approve the final color comp, the, the, it's really just the only thing that's going to change is when you squint your eyes, the comp looks just like the final. Just the final has a shit ton more detail. So it's like third read details are the only thing that he's adding and tighten things up. But if we start asking for changes at this level, it's it's pretty much a disaster. It'll kill the schedule, and honestly, it'll kill the it'll kill the image. I mean, uh, no artist wants to be reworking a final painting again and again and again with large changes. Subtle changes is one thing, so uh, that's why it's important to be able to again do quick ideations to go through a lot of ideas quickly. And then I'm um, just to finish off I'm just gonna sort of scroll through uh, more illustration tasks that I've received and this was uh, actually a composition based on uh, one of Colin's artwork I, um, and um, it's just I, I sort of I did this in a different style I think that was what was asked of me to sort of but they both work um, he should probably post this up too this is really cool it's like a very comic book style here's another marketing piece uh, here I'm just gonna scroll through. Uh, there you go. This is in marking. I just decided I kind of wanted to end it in this image. This one was really fun. So, um, so this is just the work I I dropped in. Um, there's a ton ton more work, and I'm sure you guys can. If you get the art book, I guess you can probably see it there. Or if you go on our 
uh, social medias, I guess. That's it for me. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Those are great. Yeah. Okay. Okay, do I, okay, stop, share. I guess I'm up, right? Yep, you did. All right. Uh, are you guys seeing Ethan Evans concept artist yep yep we yeah. are cool okay so my name's Ethan I'm a concept artist I've been here for about two and a half years um concept out artist for about five years um let's see I've been on the project toward, a little bit towards the latter part of the project. So a lot of the stuff was established. So kind of filled in the gaps with a lot of props, environment work, um, just kind of piggybacking off these guys, awesome visual development. So uh, I kind of broke up the presentation into a few different look sets. And then I kind of, kind of dive into a few of the guys' processes for developing it. Um, first, I'm covering Mars Core UAC stuff. Um, so this was one thing, it was the, uh, escape pods. Um, a lot of times we'll start out with just like trying to nail down what Hugo wants for this. Um, for one, one restriction for this was the, we didn't want the player to feel like you can just fly this thing. So it needs to look very basic, just cheap, just so kind of sees what we arrived at. Um, kind of looks of what this thing could look like. A lot of these ships don't look like airplanes you're not going to fly these like so um a lot of times i work with 3d so i kind of dive into solving the, the problem of how this thing might work so this one's kind of like you jump in and sit um we need to think about first person what does this look like in first person so we decided on this one looks cooler in first person you jump in from the back side and shoot forward um it's kind of like just kind of breaking it down. It's a rough sketch on just what the thing could look like. And I usually dive into 3D and then paint over it. So this is kind of where we got to after that. Um, kind of trying to keep in with the UAC look. Um, hallway, just rows of skate pods. Hope I achieved what we were going for. Um, this is an animation kind of showing some breakdowns of early stuff. This early one. Hop in. It's, it's in, in game. It's a good example of like where 3D is extremely useful, obviously beyond just like a, an illustration tool to block out perspective. But what concept artists do is they answer uh, questions for the team. I mean, there's uh, once we approve this concept, there's uh, a bunch of teams that will kick in from animation to lighting to world building. A lot of money will be spent uh, and a lot of development time uh, will, will kick into action. So, uh, the, the more that the concept team can spell out for people uh, and, and the studio, the better. It's a, it's a pretty critical job. Um, and that's a good example of where like utilizing 3D, not to sell the design of the thing, but to sell it broad strokes of how it functions uh, was, was extremely useful. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I come from an industrial design background, so I kind of, maybe I'm more thorough than I need to sometimes, but I like to kind of break things down and be as helpful as I can. Um, let's see, this is this is just some consoles from for the Mars Core area, more UIC stuff. These are some teleporters. Um, 
Um, it's like a viewing area. There's some area in UAC with uh, some growth over it. Um, these are some items that Doom Guy uses throughout the level. Um, so in the last game, uh, you're kind of you're going against Hayden, so you're it kind of made sense narratively to punch the the mod thing and just steal his stuff. This one it didn't really fit, so it's just some, some quick thumbnails about like what what it could be. Maybe makers like three D prints a weapon. Uh, maybe it's a Sentinel thing. So we didn't really know. Um, Hugo guided that along, and we thought it'd be cool if like a drone sent by a is it a see a drone is sent to you and just kind of some options. Uh, maybe the UA, maybe the GUI pops up in front of you. Maybe you can like pick a gun and the, the, I don't know. It's just playing with suggesting ideas. Maybe it shows up through your visor. Um, some, some early sketches and then I dived in 3d again and, and kind of refined it in ZBrush. I think I maybe took this one a little bit further than I needed to. <laughs> it's cool though. And, yeah. Uh, this is another device he uses. So this is the auto map station. So you click on this and then shows all the maps, all the secret items. Um, a lot of times I'll just get, do a rough sketch just to communicate an idea and then uh, get the okay from Hugo and then push it from there. Um, is... what, what's really cool about what he's showing here again, I'm speaking to the expiring concept artists is that, um, you know, in a video game, this stuff, the player can see it from like any angle, they could crouch down, they could zoom in with their scope, like, and they interact with these things, like, I mean, for countless hours. So, uh, plus then they might replay through the game again and again. So you really have to, it, it, it's still entertainment, so you're still faking a lot of the engineering, but with uh, Ethan's background, he's, he's an actual industrial designer, so he doesn't have to fake it too much. But the, um, uh, the, the assignment uh, means that you do have to make it make some kind of sense. You know, um, I would say, honestly, a toy, a, a function, um, as long as things move correctly and, and there's not a massive amount of collision uh, with, with the geo, it's good enough. But it's part of what makes uh, working in video games really satisfying is as a designer, you see that they're able to uh, work out all the, the mechanics of their designs and really, really, really flesh them out um, beyond just like a quick mood painting, which um, in some instances, that's just enough. You know, like if you're working on a commercial or a movie and this thing's going to be on screen for just a couple seconds or a few minutes, you know, you could just do a sexy painting, capture the, the moment and we're good. Uh, and somebody else, you know, you, the, the, the audience doesn't really make out what the object is anyway. But in the case of games, uh, very oftentimes the audience is going to see it full bright and spend probably like 20, 30, 40, 50 hours with the thing. So you better you better think it through, which I think makes it uh, fun for the concept team. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it's it's basically we're creating simulations in a way. So <laughs> the higher the fidelity of things get, um, I guess the stakes get a little higher to make it feel a little bit believable. Um, here's the final. Um, here's some Sentinel stuff. This is developing the door. Um, Again, some rough sketches in the Sentinel design language, how it might open. Um, this is like effects are on it. Did it was it like a tear through the through the world and where, where it showed up? Um, let's see this is how it opens. I think we we introduced a little bit of the wolf fiction to the Sentinels and threw that in there. Um, this is the key part. So it's like, how do you get the key for this? Uh, I think they, they toyed with the idea of him kind of dipping his sword in and then using the sword as like the key. Um, just random ideas. Um, let's see. I don't know. It's Doom guy. So maybe he has like a key that's like uh, his brass knuckles or something. Um, I think we arrived more in a traditional key look so right here. Uh, let's see. This was just a sentinel painting. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Do, I don't do a ton of environment paintings, but I, I felt good about this one. Let's see doors. 
sewer. It's the throne the king sits on. I think this is based off uh, Alex and, and Colin's stuff. Let's see, it's the, uh, it's the engine for the Doom guy's, uh, what is it called? His cave? Or <laughs> what is it called, Hugo? It's the Fortress of Doom. The Fortress of Doom, yes. Fortress of Doom. Powers the ship through this. Some stained glass stuff. Uh, this is another kind of process oriented one is the art complex. This is stuff you'll kind of get from level designers. They're, they have a basic idea of like how it will operate, it works from a level standpoint. So, um, let's see. By the way, Ethan, you might want to slow down a little bit because the uh, people in the chat they want to like spend some time to look. Oh, look at the, at images, the images. Yeah. Yeah. Going a little bit fast. The art complex. So uh, this one's also kind of weird. It's like you have to aim down. You have to aim downward for this. Sometimes you'll get weird scenarios where it's just sorry. You know, yeah, roll, full screen. Roll the constrictions. Is it how big is it? Oh yeah, that's. Yeah, just wanted to make sure you were full screen. Yeah. So kind of a early breakdown jump on it, kind of go through the elevator, ride it up, and then and that evolved to uh, just me finding out more things I got to figure out, how this works. It aims downward, so maybe we elevate the target he needs to shoot at. Um, then you'd start thinking about it in first person, like how does this guy approach it? Um, how does it look from first person when the barrels, you want him to come down to the side and the whole sequence to be cool looking. Um, so we didn't want them to sit down. So you kind of just run up to it and stand and then, and operate the thing. All right, Ethan. Uh, it says uh, the bottom right button on the screen. So to, to make it. Fun. Oh, right there. Is that better? <laughs> A little bit, but yeah, that's <laughs> okay. Thanks. Uh, there's the, detailed concept of it. So 3D and then paint over. Uh, interior. Here's like another little breakdown of some animations I did and it goes up the elevator shaft. How it might look in first person. down the tar tower. I think in the game they use like a big tentacle that you shoot. Some more Sam's base stuff. Uh, it's like a ener Argent Energy area. Kind of early sketches for that. Um, this is a lobby of the the uh, tower. Some maker stuff. Uh, let's see, store was based off. It was like a. A lot of times you'll like a guy like Emerson will do a painting and then they'll John will kind of point out an area and be like, Can you do a detailed concept of what this thing looks like? So this was a door that was in Emerson's concept and I called it out and just kind of detailed it out a little bit more. Um, some props, this is a punch prop. You punch it for puzzles. Cultist, there's a lobby. And again, all the all this, a lot of this stuff was all the visuals were already established. So it's me just like sticking with the language and making it look as cool as possible. There's a drone maintenance area. 
One of the things that's important to notice is that the way he's designing things, he's building them with uh, repetition in mind. Uh, we always have to be mindful of what, uh, you know, these things have to actually be built. So as much as possible, we're kind of, uh, they're concepting with like a kit in mind. Uh, and then um, those, those things will be translated to 3D and make it much more efficient. Let's see, uh, crates. Another door. A little animation call out. Anytime you could make things move uh, on screen for the player, it looks cool. Um, you know, it's not just like, sure, a door could just open, but it's just so much cooler when it opens with locking mechanisms that turn and shift. I mean, motion and movement in um, in in entertainment design is usually a really good thing. Totally. And then some hell stuff. This is like a vista view from the battlefield map. This is like a platform that falls down when you stand on it for too long. So maybe it, maybe it's rocks, so maybe it's something like the. I think it was the metal hell kit. I think we stuck with the one on the left. You see um, how like how many different assignments um, he would he's working on at any given time. All the guys are like this. Um, you really don't want to be struggling with your technique. I think the biggest uh, thing on display here with all the guys is that they have really solid fundamentals. That's what we look for in concept artists is like very, very strong uh, fundamentals. Um, and so if you're, if you've only sort of uh, mastered like one sort of technique, you know, like you're, there's one thing that you can do and you can do it really well, you're going to get exposed on the job pretty pretty quickly like when i say exposed i mean you're going to get an assignment that like that technique doesn't work for and it's it's uh, not a good feeling um i've been there i mean we all have so um what you really want to do is make sure that your fundamentals are really really strong i would i would focus on figure drawing uh kevin uh kevin chen who's a good friend of ben's and mine's uh you know he teaches a fantastic class on figure drawing where they focus on structure and and values and th those are the ABCs of, of good technique, you know, and those, those, if you could render the figure in black and white inside of an hour and have it look convincing and really understand value structure and control and edges and all those good things, then you could, that, that, that will form the basis of your technique as a concept artist. And then on top of that, you have to combine with that really, really good fundamentals of design, like how to make things appealing um, how to, there's, there's certain design principles that you could use to make things just look appealing. And, um, because it's a combination of design and technique. And when you struggle with either of those, your day job is going to be miserable. You know, it's, it's going to be a, a not fun experience. So look at how many different things Ethan does, uh, all the guys and, and, um, but their, their solid technique, their, their solid fundamentals, uh, carries them through it. It, it, it applies to everything that they do. So, we don't, I can't just say, well, Ethan's just the floating rock guy. Cause he just has a really good rock technique and that's it. You know, um, he could, he could do anything. Let's see, here's a, let's see a mouth door. This is in the hell growth area. Um, let's see tons of yellow around this. You really want to communicate to the player, like, highlight areas that they need to go so some some weird iterations of like what what is he picking up um some hellish things i think it arrived at more of a traditional key that john did a paint over of um it's kind of a weird idea maybe you tear a tear a heart out of a demon and it like screams at the door and it opens but uh, <laughs> see this is a like a hell area the whole fiction of like this is a maker tower at the top and then the tower the uh machine you need to like break the chain so that the the thing falls down and you ride it up to the maker world so so it's kind of like a combination of environment piece plus level design Um, here's some guitars. These are fun. It was 
he has a doom guy has a man cave so he needs some guitars so i just painted some up based off the look sets of the game let's see lastly you get some cosmetics um some podiums these are all going to be upgraded so maybe you have like the kind of lame one and the cool one Some based on the look sets of the game, Just some kind of fun ones. It's like a hell growth one. It's a UAC one. It's a metal hell. Some Sentinel. This is just repurposing uh, the Slayer Gate. 3D model. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I grew up in the the southeast, so this is kind of like the the uh, the hillbilly redneck guy. <laughs> this is based off a concept by Alex. Uh, let's see. Cause this is based off the uh, the old Revenant. Uh, some hipsters. That, that's that's what I got. It was so much personality. I should throw that in there too. Like, I mean, <laughs> concept artists are storytellers, you know, and, and um, you really have to have a good sense of, um, I mean, there's so much humor in these, there's drama, there's like a narrative that he's painting with some of the more serious uh, sci-fi stuff. And then in this stuff, you know, there's just tons of humor, which I think all the concept guys excel at. So uh, the, co the concept department is, is uh, uh, a place where ideas are born, you know, um, that's usually the first, the, the tip of the, uh, of the spear for the, for the team, you know, uh, we, we start there and, and it's a great job. You get exposed to a lot of different, uh, parts of the process and, and you're honing, um, uh, all aspects of, of, uh, of your creative skill set. you know, from storytelling to design to straight illustration techniques. Um, I think this with this, the, the, the huge um, variety of work on display here from from uh, Ethan and all the guys is uh, is really cool. I think it's it's I, I've I've always I want it to be the kind of studio that I would want to work at, you know. And I think I'd rather work at a place that really pushes me creatively. And uh, I think that that um, the stuff you're seeing here is a really great example of that. Just so so cool. So it's such a variety. Yeah, I mean, working on Doom Eternal, it really pushes you just to the variety of work you get to do and hellish stuff, the sci-fi stuff. It's like I can't think of another game where you get to just get out of your comfort zone and grow as an artist. Thanks for that, Ethan. These are great. How do I... Uh, hand over control what do i do uh just stop screen share oh there we go next up we have uh joe all right um let me get this screen share going Okay, um, can you guys see this all right? Yes. Okay. Um, cool, so yeah, so uh, I joined ID back in 2018. And um, so much of the, uh, the, the visual, like the, the visual language of Doom had been developed. Um, and so like, uh, I guess it, it, that, was, that was a good thing for me because this was my first job in the industry and um, I got to riff off of the, the really cool form language that had been um, that had been established from all these amazing artists. And uh, like for me, joining it as my first job, it, it felt like I was like jumping into SEAL Team 6, like as a, 
as a cadet, you know, it was, a, it was pretty daunting and intimidating, but like, it's been an amazing experience. And I think just as I've got to grow as an artist, I've come to like, really admire these guys even more and just like, um, see like, just how, how much like, just be inspired to, to, to see like, uh, you know, how, uh, to be the, to be like the artist that I want to become, um, just seeing like how much they, they put their time into everything and, you know, are, are really dedicated, but, um, yeah, so, uh, I'll continue off of the, uh, PVP podium train that Ethan started. Um, and, I, and my, my presentation will be a little shorter. I just picked some of my few favorites, uh, that I've done, um, over the, the course of eternal, but, uh, this was a, a hell podium uh, based on the, um, the the form language of a uh, necrovol, just like this this map. Um, so just like hell, like with the really uh, kind of uh, like swooping sharp arch archways and skulls, and uh, that the the blue the the blue flames are kind of a, a nice touch that we added, and um, yeah. So and and one thing I was try to keep in mind when I'm, I was doing these podiums because they were like a, a fun architectural exercise, but I also wanted to make them feel like, uh, like as a, as a player, like you really feel like proud or just uh, pr proud of earning them, you know, just like, because you, you have to go through like certain, um, what do you call it, like uh, achievements to, to get them. So it's, you want to like, feel proud that you have them. So just try to make them as cool as possible. Um, so there's that one. Um, and this is another one that I got to riff off of the UIC form language. It's just basically like um, futuristic uh, space, hu human space technology. Um, this one's earth tech. So that, that's basically just like bl blue as the main color tone instead of uh, instead of white, which is traditional UIC. Um, but yeah, so this is an example of just like the podium, the final product. So uh, yeah, you, you wanna, like I was saying, you wanna, as a player, just feel like like proud to have a po the podium and just like um, kind of show off your character. Um, yeah, so the next one was, uh, this was a, an image I did for the, uh, the Icon of Sin map, the, the last level in the game. Um, th this is like the first arena fight um, that you do. It's, uh, so it's, pretty, it's pretty early on in the level. You, like, you jump, there's like, if you can see my mouse, you like land on the wall climb and then that starts the arena fight. Uh, and so like, it starts off for, for like this kind of assignment, like it starts off just getting a, a, a block out from the, the level designer. And then, and, and then from there, I just like to help me figure things out. I would just like a, do, do like a, a line drawing sketch, like put, put in just like hints of the architecture, like knowing that these are gonna be like, a, 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 what do you call like those giant, like tower lights or, um, and just trying to figure, figure out, uh, what, what type of, um, objects are going to go where. And then from there, it's just, yeah, adding in, um, as you can tell, it's, this is photo bashed. So just like adding, piecing it together, kind of like a puzzle and then adding the lighting on top. I think in the final level, um, or in the final rendition, like, we toned down the red and it's more like of a, it's more like, it's more bluish, but, um, but yeah. And then, um, the next thing was the, these, uh, night sent or the sentinel spears that the night sentinels and the Atlans have. I think the final version is actually, a even, even longer than this, but, uh, but, um, but yeah, for, for, for this, this weapon was pretty fun to design and it's fun, fun to see how it's used by the, the characters in the game or the, the, the sentinels in the game. Um, when I was 
trying to make this, I try to like give it a sense of like uh, craftsmanship. Like it was just a, like the, the Sentinel technology, even though it's like can get look a little a bit a bit brutal, but I also wanted to show like um, they're they're like expert craftsmen, so I, I wanted to put in like um, intricate details that that show that the, their level of craftsmanship is is really high. But I I didn't want it to get like too flowery or ornate like elvish, so I think that's that that was something that the the guys fig, try uh, try to figure out um, before me that that I, I riffed off on. And then I wanted it the, to be like the, the focal point of the spear or just like the, because it's an energy blade, I wanted it to look a little unconventional, not just like a, like a standard hilt with like an energy blade. I wanted it to some kind of like, uh, kind of futuristic or like uh, uh, unique looking, uh, so, so, so that kind of sells the idea that this is like a, advanced, like um, energy powered. Um, and then like here, here, like, oh, well, there's the, this is an even shorter version, but there's the, the drawing just to kind of show like my process. Like I'll, I'll just, it helps to just draw it first and then light it. But then um, this is an example, like, uh, or a screenshot. So I, I think like with the, the, there are two colors. There's like the blue one, and then there's like the red one. Um, the they're they're blue when um, they're blue when the uh, when you, the Slayer first uh, meets these guys because they're they're not hostile to him. He hasn't killed the the uh, priest yet. Spoiler alert! But the then then after he he kills the priest, like they turn hostile and they're red. And then there's like a a really large version um that the atlas holding and i think you like run across it and, and put in a battery in it to, to stab a hole in the demon's chest so yeah it was that that's that was really cool to to see it like um, utilized in, in these ways and then um i just had one more there's a this one was the uh the blade used to stab the uh icon of sin um in the game the when you when you first get it it's supposed to be ambiguous i think uh hugo specifically asked for it to be like pretty ambiguous that you you wouldn't know what it is until the very end when it um turns into the blade and uh his specific reference was um was the uh the switchblade gamora switchblade from avengers so it's like you know, if these knives or the blades were worn out, it maybe you could tell it's like a knife, but it's it's still pretty ambiguous. So, uh, um, yeah, that's that's something I was trying to aim for, just like make, make it pretty pretty ambiguous and still also playing out the sentinel, uh, um, the sentinel look, wanting wanting but wanting to make it look like it's just like a high level craftsmanship and just like that. I go with the, the glowing blue that's kind of uh, um, iconic to the Sentinels. And then uh, in the game, so so there's like the the part in the game where the Slayer gets it. And then um, there's the part where it's like, turns into the blade. And um, there's, a, there's kind of a funny story with this. I was watching a, a streamer on YouTube, uh, like watch, watch the gameplay um, or no, watch this cutscene, and like when when the slayer or when the betrayer tosses this to the slayer, I think the the guy was like, "Cool vape, bro," and I was like, "Awesome, mission accomplished." He he doesn't know what it is, so um, but yeah, that's that's it. Uh, pretty short and sweet. And with that, I will uh, pass it on to Emerson. Thanks, Joe. Right. Okay. Um, let me get this going. Share screen. Share. All right. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. No. 
As I can't tell. I don't know what happened to yeah. uh, the chat room. That's right. All right. Looks okay. Um, so my name is Emerson Tong. I've been at It Software for about six and a half years now. I'm a senior concept artist there. Um, and I'll be talking about the Marauder and uh, Erdak, which uh, I played a big role in designing. And uh, I'm gonna start off with the uh, Marauder. So, so um, the, the idea of the Marauder actually came about really early in development for Doom Eternal. Um, it was during pre-production where uh, a bunch of us in the concept team, me, Alex, John, Colin, we were just like tossing around ideas of like what we would like to see in, in the game. And um, one of the uh, characters I pitched was this um, kind of demonic gunslinger type demon that would act almost like an anti doom slayer. Um, the basic idea was like, what if, what if we had like a demonic doomslayer? Like, what if hell decided like, oh, um, we'll create our own champion to go up against the doomslayer. And uh, that's where the, uh, the idea initially started. And uh, in, in this drawing here, you could see like, uh, like I took a lot of like elements from the, uh, the doomslayer design from like Doom 2016, but we kind of demon demonify it, uh, if, if that's a word, um, kind of gave him like a, a, a skullish demonic face, like a helmet. Um, but I also did one version that that resembles even more like the, uh, the Doom 2016 Doom Marine, but just having like the other elements uh, kind of demonic looking like he has a, a revolver shotgun, which <laughs> was something I, I pitched that I thought would be cool to see. Um, but as like, as we went along and ideate more, uh, Hugo kind of pitched the idea of what if instead uh, of these guys being like demonic versions of the Doomslayer, what if they were, were Doomslayer's fallen comrades, right? Like what if they were night sentinels that, that kind of were corrupted by hell? And that's when like I, I started ideating them in like a different direction. Um, uh, at, at this stage, like it, the, the task itself became a little complicated because I had to solve both what would the sentinel, what would the night sentinel look like on top of like creating like a demonic version of them, right? So you could see like I was trying out different mo motifs that I thought could be cool. Um, like with this one, I thought what if the night sentinels had like armor that were based on like ravens, right? Like um, I, I thought that could have been a cool motif. Um, but I think ultimately that that was maybe too bloodborne, too fantasy um, to fit into Doom. And with this one, um, like he, I guess this was kind of based like on knights, like gunslinger knights, maybe like maybe that's what the night sentinels were. Um, I even tried like, what if what if they could be like samurais, like cyber samurais? I, I thought that that could have been something cool. Um, and, and the middle one, it's uh, it's it's a design that I guess we we went back a little bit and tried to mirror um, the Doom 2016 armor, but tried to make it like maybe look a little evil. Maybe maybe this type of armor could even be like a prototype to like a uh, depredator suit. Um, with this one, like it's also another, I guess a little weird sci-fi design that's that's like got night elements to it and like the Praetor armor elements. And here, like on the one on the left is, it's kind of based on the, uh, the, the Night Sentinel bros that you see in Doom 2016, but kind of like turning them demonic and like showing like how like hell's corruption would have like changed their armor. Um, and here we have like just another design that's based on the, the Doom Marine Praetor suit, you know, like, but kind of added like medieval elements to it, you know, like, like having like skulls hanging on. 
Um, something that Hugo talks about a lot when we're designing characters um, is how, how they should feel like McFarlane action figures. Um, for those who are familiar with like Spawn and like their line of action figures, they're, they're always very, like they, they've got a very heavy metal vibe to it. And, you know, you have a lo lot of details of like spikes and like skulls everywhere. And, and I think like that's usually like a touchstone we use when we're designing characters at it. Um, here, like the one on the right, I was like looking at a lot of, I think gladiator armors, right? Like you, you see them having a lot of um, this sort of asymmetrical motif where like one side is more armored than, than the other side. And I think it was, it was here where we started feeling like may maybe we have something here. Like, like maybe this is a direction that we could go with like um, what the Knight Sentinels could be wearing, right? Like instead of, um, instead of like referencing Knights, we, we kind of like started leaning more on like Knight Sentinels being type of like a gladiator race. And, and here is when we really felt like we were starting to hone into something uh, that the Night Sentinels could be. So you, you kind of ha have that asymmetrical um, armor, like that's very gladiator-like, right? Um, if, if anything, I think there was a lot of, there's some influence from like cartoons like He-Man to, you know, um, in these designs. And, and I think that, that kind of matches the vibe that, that we were trying to go for, right? Like with Doom Eternal, we, there's a lot of like throwback to, to like 80s cartoon, well, like to heavy metal. And, and I think this design started to encapsulate all of that. And, and instead of just having guns, we, we decided that maybe the Night Sentinel race, they do have like crucibles as well. And um, that's why you see, like, I was experimenting with, with the Marauder actually having his own uh, crucible sword. Uh, but at one point I thought, what, what if it was an ax instead, right? Like I, I think a, a crucible ax is, is actually a pretty cool idea. And I think this, this was when we finally got like a final approved, like semi-approved design for the Marauder, um, like, from this point onwards, there's just minor changes to uh, to the armor design, but for the most part, the uh, the big motifs are there. Where we have, um, you know, we have the Doom Marines kind of like power source, kind of reflected on here, um, and we have like a symbol. Like instead of the Slayer symbol, we felt the Marauder will have his own symbol uh, to represent himself. And this is what we ended up with, with the uh, final design and turnaround. Uh, if like, instead of going with like a giant spike here and, and this kind of diamond S motif, we switched to like having sort of like semi-circle blades on his armor. Like we imagined that, you know, he could actually use his armor as a weapon if he wants to, like he could just like ram into you like a football player. And um, we have like hard point knobs all over his armor that there are almost like brass knuckles, you know, like all over. And instead of just having like regular skull, like I, I kind of added these um, almost fantasy skull grenades, uh, which ultimately was not used, but I thought that was still like a cool motif to add, you know, and, you know, we, we brought back the shotgun for him too. And this was the uh, the illustration that um, that I used to kind of pitch that of like how he could look like in environment in the game, and and we would do this sometimes for like our characters just so we like like we could see if like the character fits in the environment that that we create for like the game, and and would it feel like a Doom game if we see him coming towards you. Um, this was like, I believe ultimately used for our reveal in Doom in, in QuakeCon 2018. And, and I think this was the first time people saw the Marauder. And I was actually surprised just based on this illustration, a, a bunch of people actually started making fan art of him. And I thought that was kind of cool. 
And uh, so like after I finished this illustration, um, Hugo actually came to me and said like, I, I want a fire wolf. I, I want a fire wolf next to him. And, and I, I legit thought Hugo was joking, but he wasn't. And uh, so he ended up having a fire wolf where uh, this, like where a lot of players seem to, uh, to have uh, taken a liking, uh, a love-hate relationship to. And so when, when, I, when I finished the, uh, the concept for the Marauder, it, it was still so early on in development for this character that the, uh, the uh, design team actually haven't really had a move set for him yet. Um, so the way we work at it, sometimes the uh, design, the design AI team will have like uh, an idea with like a list of move sets where they want to see in in a character. But for the Marauder, it was it, it kind of worked in reverse where like they didn't have a move set. So I got to pitch like different attack ideas on like how the uh, the Marauders could attack, and like here at the top, it was just like a basic swing, which um, I. Th ultimately did make it into the game and like in the game his his eyes would flash green and you would have like a small window to attack him before he uh, he strikes you with like the axe swing like I thought like maybe it would be cool if he had like a, another combo attack where he like kind of like axe uppercuts you and then like shoots you with his shotgun but I think that might ultimately be too too powerful and he might just kill you with it there's an axe throw idea this was the uh, idea of like him throwing his uh, his his skull grenades at you, and this is yeah another sheet of like ideas of like how he could like summon his wolf to like to attack you, and this is just to show how um, from the Marauder final design that we we came up with we reverse engineered and see what would like the uh, human night sentinels uh, look like uh, before they were corrupted and uh, like before, you know, during the time of like the golden age. Uh, ultimately it also inspired the, uh, the design that uh, King Novik has in the game. And here's another example of like how taking the Marauders design language that we came up with, we were able to apply to something like the Atlan um, which were giant robots that the uh, Night Sentinel army used uh, back in the Golden Age. And that's all I have for the uh, Marauder. And now we'll go into uh, Erdak. So um, like early on in development, uh, we, I, I guess the team knew we were going to show heaven in Doom Eternal and uh, early on, we decided that we didn't want heaven to look like the uh, the cliche portrayal that you see in like popular media with like giant, like, you know, we're not going to see angels with giant bird wings and we're not going to see heaven with like giant pearly gates, like with like chorus of angels singing. Um, to, to create heaven for doom, we, we felt like it needed to be dark. It, it needed to have some sort of edge and feeling of like heavy metal to it. And so like I, I started up with just looking for a whole bunch of references that I, I thought I could use to, to create this version of heaven uh, for this game. So a lot of the influences that, uh, that I went to was, was things like um, H.R. Giger was a big one, you know, uh, his designs for, uh, for Alien was, was very influential to uh, the design that we ended up using for Erdak. Um, I, I grew up with a lot of like anime influences. So, you know, um, artists like Makoto Kobayashi uh, played a big part, like, um, like Keita Amemiya is another artist that I look to a lot. And he did a lot of these um, cult classic um, guys in rubber suit type of uh, shows, you know? Um, so they were like a, a huge influence to, to like what we use in Erdak. And like, I, I was also thinking that maybe 
uh, I think this was pitched by Hugo because Hugo was pitching like, what if, what if heaven, uh, the race of heaven was, was, you know, like a race of AI beings. And so that's how I ended up looking at more mechanical, like I, I thought like, you know, having like engine motifs could be cool to see like almost this biomechanical type look. And um, Alex had already done the uh, the concept for the icon of sin. And, and I actually liked the language that he came up with for the armor. And I thought like, maybe we could incorporate that into like, like the look of heaven. Like what if the armor encasing the icon of sin were like restraints instead of uh, an actual armor right like what if this this kind of encasing was was created by heaven to to encase the icon of sin to prevent it from going berserk so these were like really really early sketches that i've done um for uh, for, for well Erdak. um do you have uh do you have any anything on your fiction um the, the fiction stuff yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't put in the slide in here, but... Uh, well, I'll tell the story because it's yeah. a good one, Emerson. Emerson um, came, came up with the fiction for uh, the makers uh, as well. And, and as uh, John Lane has come up with a lot of our fiction, um, Colin comes up with some fiction, but, but Emerson really did a fantastic job uh, creating, uh, you know, it, it, he, he had to build a world. I mean, he built like a... A society with a structure. Uh, he could, I'm sure, he could talk a little bit more about it. But it was, it was a huge part of the process, and and a big reason why uh, it is so cool. Yeah, um, yeah. Like like adding to what Hugo said, um, halfway through the process, because heaven was so new to uh, to the Doom universe, we actually had to work from the inside out. So and and then that kind of involved coming up with with. Um, the fiction of how this society came into being, like how, how did heaven start existing, right? Like this is, this is the story of Genesis for, for the Doom universe. Like what, how did the makers came about? And um, I'll, I'll probably talk more about it as, as, as we go along. So I have like accompanying images, but this, this was like the uh, first few ideas that I came out with where like, what if, um, what if heaven in, in the doom universe was based on the idea of like the tree of life right like what if the the entire city of, of heaven was this kind of like tr biomechanical tree looking thing that would have like you know different parts of like there, there would be the, the mind chamber or the heart chamber and and almost like it, i i kind of saw like this environment almost as like a living, breathing uh, being and, and not just like a, an environment. And that's why I, I came up with like ideas of what if all the buildings were alive and, you know, they, they, they were sentient and, and you could interact with them. Um, we ultimately didn't go in this direction because uh, it's, it's not exactly kid friendly. Like it would, it would be really, really expensive for the uh, environment guys to build like um, specific pieces uh, to build out our environment. So um, ultimately, like, you know, I, I had to take like all these ideas that I already have and, and to create a more um, kid friendly version, like a version that like the 3D artists could build out a little easier. And, and that's how we, we arrived at this image here. Um, this was which which also I just want to add on that like that also makes architecture when you're designing it look more realistic because if you look around the world I mean everything is built in kits right you've got moldings and they all look the same all the doors in your house look the same so the more that things become one-offs the less real it looks so uh, there, there are artistic limitations to having a lot of a lot of unique pieces but you have to be selective when you use them but when you make things uh, like a kit it, it actually makes help sell uh, the believability uh, of the environment. Yep. And uh, so this image, uh, it was, you know, in, inspired by all the things that I, I mentioned before, like the idea that, that Erdak could be this living, breathing biomechanical organism. 
and and taking it and and putting it into a more kid like uh, formation so you could see like you know there's like repeating motifs um, throughout the uh, the environment and like the motif here is is ultimately inspired by by cathedral designs where you would always see like um, really monolithic like horizontal pieces and and they're usually flanked by like vertical uh, monolithic um, pieces and and so that's kind of what I, I tried to do here to kind of bring back like uh, the sense of like there, there's something holy and, and religious uh, about this place and you know like designs like that was uh, like motif designs like this were, were inspired by like stained glass but what if the stained glass were, were designed by by H.R. Giger right like they would look way more biomechanical um, and so like when, when I showed this to Hugo, I, I, that's when I got the green light where, yeah, this is, this is what Erdak will look like in, in our game. And, and here like our references that I use to decide what type of um, materials and, and, and uh, colors and trims that we could use for the environment, right? Like, cause when I, when I think of like marble sculptures, I, I think of the Renaissance and you know during the renaissance there were a lot of like holy and religious art made and and i think giving erdak this marble like uh, material look would would actually kind of give you the sense of of that that holy and religious feeling that that i was trying to convey so and this was this is ultimately what that painting ended up becoming um, if you notice from the sketch, we had like more structured type pathways for the player. Uh, but here, um, it, it kind of turned into like this organic terrain because um, the, uh, the environment lead layer was, was asking me to, to concept like what, what could the, uh, the terrain, like the organic part of, of Erdak look like? And um, I mean, Obviously, that that got me thinking about how, like how t natural terrains are formed on Earth. You know, like you have you, you have like rocks forming different ways of like, you know, some are formed through like heat, while others are formed through through pressure. You know, like you have you have like terrains on Earth where um, it it they are formed from like layers and layers of like organic mat matter being piled on top of each other and and like immense pressure kind of create this almost like layered look to them and and that got me thinking like that actually kind of looks a lot like what 3d printing looks like right um if, if any one of you ever used like a 3d printer um you notice like it like the the object that you print out comes out in layers and and sometimes like those layers get messed up and, and you create this almost very interesting look of like that that mimics what what natural terrain on earth look like so so I, I i was pitching the idea like oh what if the makers they they 3d print their environment because they're so they're such an advanced race that they have the capabilities to to do something like that right and like I also added like, um, you know, um, these kind of energies shooting out of the cathedral because I thought like, you know, what, what if the, uh, the maker race, what if they used um, like the most pure form of origin energy and, and that is what gives them like power and, and that, that creates like the golden halos that you see throughout like Erdak and and yeah, going going back to the terrain, um, Austin Klein, uh, one of our environment artists, actually took it took that idea of three uh, D printed terrain like even further, where if you zoom in into like the terrains in Erdag, you would actually see all these um, almost circuitry like looking patterns, and and that kind of gives it this sense of like this this terrain isn't isn't natural, like it, it's artificially made by by the makers um and so this this was like a reference sheet that i use um 
before I started doing the uh, the uh, interior designs for for Erdac, um, again, you know, I, I wanted Erdac to feel like 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 it like you're you're being in like a holy place when you enter Erdac, and so these are like shots that I found on the internet of the uh, Saint Peter's Basilica, and this is in the Vatican City, I believe. And, you know, there's just something about this image that I was really, really drawn through, like just seeing all the gold trims, um, all of, like the intricate details, like, you know, the marble-esque uh, walls and, and just like all the gold and this, this shining thing in the middle, like, like it just captivated me. And that actually, if you, if you look at this image right here, it's the exact composition that I used for this uh, interior design that I did for Erdac, um, it's. What one second? The, what's important? You notice that all the guys are doing, and it's great that it, uh, Emerson included this. A big part of the process, uh, not just that it, but I think of any good design process is, is really getting taking taking the time to make a really good image board. Um, if you don't, you're you're you can really have all your conversations and around that i mean we we review the image boards uh as closely as we do the initial sketches i think the mistake is that you will get an assignment and dive right into sketches but uh that just means you're going to end up drawing something that's probably looks a lot like the last thing you drew so the image board process uh and then picking a few keywords is also a good exercise and something to be taken pretty seriously the at con in concept that it uh, we take it very seriously, and and it's uh, it makes sure that we get off on the right foot there. I'm glad that he included these; they're awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, like I, I, I want to jump in real quick, uh, Emerson. I just wanted to uh, let you know I want to, we I do want to save the last 10, 15 minutes for questions. Yeah. I'm not sure how much more you have, but uh, just wanted to possibly speed it up a little bit. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I can do that. I don't have much more anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, back to this image, um, you know, like it, it, I was trying to capture a lot of the feeling from that, the, uh, the reference board that I give. So I want, I wanted it to feel like there, there's, there's a sense of like holy and religiousness to this place and um, using the, like, like usually a lot of people do not use one point perspective when, when we do like environment concepts, but I, I think it, for, for an image like this, it actually helps sell the religious nature of, of this place, right? Like when, when you, a lot of images that have religious connotations to it, they, they tend to use this one point perspective thing. And um, on top of that, you know, there's obvious influences from like HR Giger, you know, we, we have, this sarcophagi like um, structures that that are littered throughout Erdac. And, and this is what got us thinking more in the fiction, right? Like what if um, Erdac is made out of, of like the souls of the makers, right? Like when makers are put to rest, um, they are actually put into all these sarcophagi and, and they end up powering and, and becoming one with the uh, environment itself. You, you know, you have like, um, something like this where where the makers like would be put to rest like almost reminiscence of like pharaohs from like egyptian from the egyptian age and so these are just miscellaneous um erdak paint overs uh you know like uh, the environment guys would give me like a paint over of different sections of of the block out and i will go in and like do a quick paint over you know here retaining like you know the motifs of like cathedral like structures you know just to bring back that that sense of re religious nature of this place uh this was uh, one of the uh, an another interior design where i thought we could like flip the ratio of like like the white marble versus the uh, the red mechanical parts and i i think it, it kind of gives it almost like this uh fleshy like meat it, it almost feels as if you're like in the uh, internal organs of a structure, right? Like of a, of a giant uh, living being and, and you're inside it. And these are like designs that I did for the uh, archangels. Uh, I thought these would be like, 
it will be interesting to see these beings just flying around Erdak and, you know, they act as like the guardians of this place. Um, very uh, not so subtle religious uh, motifs there, right? Like, like it's, it's shaped like a cross. Um, but it, it also kind of looked like, like an angel with like outstretched arms, like coming towards you. And, you know, this ultimately became the, uh, the uh, final, final design for uh, Erdak. And you actually see this when you, uh, when you enter Erdak for the first time and, and uh, Samuel Hayden actually says the line, uh, magnificent, isn't it? And um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's all I have for Erdak. And I guess I'll pass it back to you, Ben. All right, thanks a lot, Emerson. Cool, so I just wanna get us kicked off right away with some questions. Go ahead and start um, typing in any questions that you guys might have into the chat and we'll, we'll pick and choose. Um, I'll, let me see, I have some already prepared that I can, I can sort of go, go on. Um, let's see. There's a lot of questions about coming concept artists. Okay, Doom has such a rich history with fans for being innovative. Was there anything within this game technologically that was different than the previous games? Um, I'm sure the tech team could go into detail uh, about that. I know that the engine is doing quite a few pretty uh, uh, amazing things. Uh, and it's all running at 60. I, I think that um, certainly we're trying to push the envelope in terms of the level of fidelity that we're able to achieve on screen uh, at 60 frames per second for a game that has an absurd amount of stuff going on at any given time between freeze bombs and flame belches and shotguns and gore and everything. I would say that the gore in particular uh, is, is, is very unique. Uh, in, in really any game. I mean, we have an entire destructible demon system that the, the concept guys could probably show you uh, just as many images about because they worked on that extensively as well. Um, so a lot of different things. The, the specifics, uh, I think I would have to leave uh, for our tech team. But uh, as always, I think we definitely feel like we're trying to push the envelope with Doom Eternal and really anything we do. Thank you. Let's see. Um... Is there any uh, is there anything you guys would like to say about the DLC coming out? Uh, it's awesome, and everybody should play it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, nothing. We can't really give away anything that we haven't said already. It, it is a continuation of Doom Eternal. Uh, um, from a gameplay perspective, uh, it is definitely going to uh, push push players. Uh, and, and, and we think that's what, that's what Doom fans want. Um, it's got some really cool fiction in it that will continue uh, the Doom story and expand the Doom universe, expand into the Doom universe, and uh, more amazing designs from these guys. Um, lots of new, really cool, creative ideas from, uh, from the whole team. And, and um, I think it's definitely some of the best levels that we've made it in. So I look forward to fans uh, getting to experience that, which I think is going to be in like two, three days. Awesome. That's good. And then let's see, I have some, okay, we've got some questions in the chat box now. Um, as concept artist, how has motivating been, motivation been going as working from now, from home is now the norm. Is it, has, has uh, working from home, like, has it been that different for you guys or is it mm -hmm. motivation wise? Hello? <laughs> what do you guys think? Um, I, it, it's kind of the same process for us. Uh, I would say in the beginning there was an adjustment and I think globally- Did I need to know this? <laughs> I think globally that, that was for a lot of people, especially in the tech industry, there was an adjustment, but I feel that we, uh, at least for myself, have gotten into a pretty good groove 
And based on the work that we've seen from the team, uh, I would say that everyone is still very motivated to do their assignments. Um, but it's, um, I don't know, anyone else? <laughs> do you feel like, uh, you know, I'll ask Alex. Alex, do you feel like you're able to be more productive? Is it easier or harder working from home than it is working uh, at your desk? Alex, are you here? <laughs> Alex Palma. I was on mute. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I was on mute. I was just talking my ass off. <laughs> okay, so it it actually did catch catch me by surprise a little bit because um, even when I'm at work, um, I'm and when I'm at home, you know, I'm still thinking about work, you know, about ideas and stuff. But because I was physically at work, I think that sort of helped me out. When I was at home, I'd sometimes draw up ideas, but I think in this case, I kind of had to learn how to be like disciplined again because it actually really, it started affecting me. I was constantly thinking about work because the computer computer was right in front of me, my work computers. I, I did step away just a, a week ago. I took a vacation because it did start to get to me. I, I was thinking about work constantly and I don't think it was helping helping me out. So in that regard, I did come up with a plan and how to be more disciplined, how to, you know, separate things like with my personal life, with kids, uh, my personal art as well, and as well as like my house stuff. So that's what, that's what my goal is right now, being work at home. Uh, doesn't mean I can't get stuff done. It's just that uh, it helps me. I've been more motivated now that I took a little break than I was like a few weeks ago. I was just like, kind of burning out a little bit and I'm, I'm not afraid to admit that that's that's kind of what I was going through and um, so it's been I guess it has been tough it wasn't at first it was it was a party at first like oh like not like we get to work at home you know get to be with the family but it wasn't it was after a while it was it, was, it got to me I I can say that so that's now you know I'm starting to relearn how to build myself again um, I have a, we have a question out here. It says, uh, wondering how long the project spent in the concept ideation phase before building assets for the final project. Say that again. How long do you guys spend in the concept or ideation phase before actually building the assets for the Wait, project? It, you know, it really fluctuates. There isn't a set amount of time. You obviously, the, the shorter that is, the better, but because um, I would say, you know, it, it's, uh, it, we really couldn't say, uh, it's a healthy amount of time. Um, and sometimes you're there longer than you intend to be. Sometimes it's faster. It's all just a matter of how fast, um, we can arrive at something that is appealing and, and fits, uh, fits the overall, uh, goals of what it is we're trying to achieve. Um, but there's no real set uh, amount of time. I see. Um, it's it's the it's the cheapest place to iterate like it's where everything begins it's a critical job so it's, it's a really really important job so uh you want to be if you're going to make mistakes you got to make it in concept and if you're going to solve problems you got to solve them in concept there are going to be tons more problems that present themselves along the way but the more problems that you solve on paper in concept uh the better off you'll be um it's a mistake to rush something out of concept because you you won't answer you will you will not have answered enough questions, and that'll kill your production uh, further down the line. And you know all the guys glossed over this pretty quickly, but like um, between the image boards, the fiction, everybody's tasked with you know uh, there are, there's high level fiction for the assignments that they're given, but there's like there's a lot of stuff to be worked out. Um, that is that is a part. It's not just drawing. You know, like um, you really do have to figure out and come up with stories for things, uh, oftentimes coming up with, as in the case of Erdak, uh, or the Sentinel stuff, you know, entire um, uh, fiction docs uh, about these places. Because if the audience will only believe this, the worlds that you create for them, uh, if you do, like you have to believe in them more than anyone. Cause nobody's, I'm not gonna believe in it if you don't, you know, as a, as a, as a consumer. Um, so these things need to be really worked out. It's a, 
I mean, it, it's uh, it's about as creative as it can get. You're using your mind as much as you are your Wacom tablet, you know, or, or your Cintiq. I mean, you're it's it's a little bit of creative writing, storytelling, acting. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, certainly design and illustration, of course. So, uh, but uh, try to get it all worked out in concept. That's my best advice for anybody who's working on anything. Work it out on the page first. Yeah. All right. Um, gonna go to. Just want to let everybody know, like we're we're doing our best to try to get to all the questions. I mean, there's a lot of questions, so there's there's just no way that we're gonna get to every single question. And I know that there's been questions submitted as well. I'm gonna to try to get to a couple of those right now. Um, speaking on the design language, uh, the Sentinel language, uh, the, for example, the, the, the Sentinel alphabet, what was the uh, design inspiration from, from that? Was it uh, related to the Elvish language from Tolkien at all? Emerson, you worked on that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess I, I, I could take this one. Um, the Sentinel? Yeah, yeah, yeah this, the Sentinel language, yeah, it, it was inspired by things like uh like the Tolkien language uh from Lord of the Rings but it's it's, it's got more roots in uh, Arabic and uh, Aramaic because um so I, I grew up in Malaysia and um it's it's a mainly Islamic country and so I would have Muslim friends that that learn the uh, the Arabic language because that's that's what they used to write when, when it comes to their religious classes and I always thought there was a a certain type of beauty to it and and that's um that ultimately inspired um the the very almost elvish like strokes that you see on like the uh, the sentinel language i see okay thank you um it you don't just you don't want to reference when you're making things you, you, we reference tolkien in terms of like an example of how a fictional universe has to be worked out to the nth degree, its own language, its own food, its own vegetables, like everything, clothing. But you don't necessarily want to look at those things and say, make it look like the Elvish. So when Emerson did it, it was like, we need our own language. Certainly, obviously, Elvish and Tolkien stuff is, is, a, is a point of reference there in terms of a fictional universe that has its own language. But I, we don't, I don't evaluate those things based on like, well, does it look enough like Tolkien? You know, like yeah. uh, the, it's, it's on Emerson to then come up with something new that we can own. But, but other than the touch point of like, we need a language and good fictional universes have them and Tolkien being one, one of the best, for sure. So could, can some of the writings be translated? Uh, I think Emerson, or don't you have some of the words worked out? Um, so <laughs> I, I don't know if this is where we'll say it, but, uh, no, the, uh, um, the Sentinel language can't be translated. It's unfortunately, um, just pure aesthetic. Uh, the, the maker language, however, um, which I did for Doom Eternal is translatable. And, uh, actually people on Reddit have already figured it out to my surprise um they they started even making like fonts uh out of it that you could just translate straight to english <laughs> nice uh, where did the idea to bring back the classic hell knight design for the gladiator come from the classic hell knight design uh john lane worked on that is john still here yeah i'm still here you um want to talk about that john yeah, that was uh, that was actually one of the options presented early on in its development. We did like a round of early ideation sketches, and uh, yeah, so pretty early on, we decided that was the way to go. Okay. Let's see, in the Doom Hunter base, we can see from the art that the facility is built above what appears to be an ancient Sentinel colony. But this level takes place on Earth. Could you expand a bit more on this? When and why did the Sentinels come to Earth? I can't say too much. Um, it is, it is uh, what it implies is that if you know the fiction, then the Sentinels uh, explore different planets and worlds, uh, you know, working for the makers. Uh, and it's implied or maybe not so much implied, but factual that Earth uh, in, in another time and place was one of those, was one of those places. Um, 
so when you read the fiction of like the doom hunters and they said that they they used to be like these creatures that that uh that inhabited earth they don't say earth but but i mean that's that's what's being implied so um when they go back there they're excavating you know you know i mean there's there's these articles on um facebook that pop up all the time that say that there could have been you know a, a whole nother um uh, uh species a, a period of life on earth that existed long before even the dinosaurs so it's just kind of based on that yeah okay thank you um this is more of a art portfolio sort of question what makes what do you guys look for in a concept art portfolio I think you see it, uh, you know, uh, John, you know, he could go into it a little bit more, but I, I think it's on display here. It's certainly um, what these, what these guys uh, are showing. What do, what do you think, John? Uh, well, it really depends on the role we're trying to fill on the team. Um, but generally speaking, we, we tend to look for artists that uh, can handle any kind of um, work that you, that you would need. So, um, and maybe our team is a little different in that regard that we prefer to have people that have more of a generalist uh, type of skill set, just because it, when, you know, pr production moves so fast, you need pretty much uh, anyone capable of helping out in any given area at any given time. So having a generalist skill set really helps. And solid fundamentals, as I said earlier, like, Pretty much, you got to have good taste and good fundamentals. Um, yeah, and I'd say, you know, a sense of design more than anything is kind of what we really look for. It's like, if you're a good designer, you can apply that to pretty much anything. Sounds good. All right, last few questions here. Um, let's see, what are the develop? Did you guys work with any other development teams or is this essentially the, the whole team? No, this is us. We try to keep um, pretty much everything in house. We do outsource some uh, late development, but it's really minimal. Um, we bring in a few contractors, but that's also really minimal. Like part of what, you know, we, it's not to say that a game that contracts a lot of workout is, is bad that by no means. I mean that, you know, some of these games are massive. They can't be made by one team. Um, just in terms of the style of uh, the genre of game that they're making, you know, uh, just happens to require uh, a, a larger team than ours. Uh, for our style of game, a single player, uh, primarily a, a single player experience uh, with, with a multiplayer component, um, it's, it's, it's better for the game overall if we keep as much of the staff uh, full-time, uh, uh, much of the staff be full-time employees as possible. Um, Everything has to have kind of a handcrafted feel to it. Everything has to be connected. And um, when you start to outsource too much stuff, there's certainly a, a threshold there. Um, things start to feel uh, disconnected and, and it, uh, it doesn't really work out too well. So, so it's, it's uh, mostly, when I say mostly, I mean like 90% uh, in-house. I see. And speaking of that, um after sort of the production has began and like the, I, I know like Alex did some of the cover concepts for later on in the project. Do a lot of the concept artists, do they move on to other projects or are they, do they like start modeling or do they change roles or are they consistently like concept artists? There's so much to do. I mean, they're, they're always going to be busy, you know, from, from there's too much to do, to be honest. There's really, I mean, it's not to say that like every single waking minute people are slammed with work, but you're, you're going to be busy, you know, pretty much all the time. So no, they, they, uh, they just move on to other things, marketing materials. Um, and then honestly, just pre-pro on, um, on other projects, like super, super, super early, early ideation on new ideas and stuff. Yeah. And I don't, I wouldn't want to either. I would, I want to say concept artists, for the remainder of my career. <laughs> However many years I'm gonna be doing this. Sounds good, sounds good. All right, uh, I'm gonna, my last question here. Uh, what did you guys learn from previous games that brought you to this game? 
uh, that you brought to this game and what is something that you learned from this game working on this game that you 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 think you're going to bring to future games you know i think to frame that question it's uh, a little bit more towards the concept guys i would mm -hmm. almost ask rephrase that question to you guys in terms of technique process as concept artist you know like almost in your craft as a concept artist not necessarily really because to be honest we really can't answer that without breaking rules about discussing future projects but i think i would love to hear what the guys think in regards to like techniques and 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 part of their process and what they learned on the project and what they'll use on the next one Colin, we'll start in the upper right-hand corner. You go first. Yeah, I was going to unmute myself. Yeah, so two simple things. One, one of the big things that I've been looking is actually <clears throat> looking at how Alex works, uh, the way he works on his paintings, and trying to essentially be more efficient when I'm just working, um, whether it's something simple like a basic design or a large-scale painting. Because going back a couple of years, I would just have hundreds of thousands of layers, that's an exaggeration, but just it would be very dense and complex. And in addition to the skill of uh, just drawing that we pick, we always learn or improve upon as we work, just looking at how other people on the team work and understanding how to be more efficient in my own work. Uh, and that's something that uh, I think is very effective. And then other than that, working on weapons, uh, getting a better understanding of that workflow and then also kind of the importance of understanding just the first person experience, which sounds silly having worked on Doom for a long time, but uh, it, it is, it's all, everything we do, at least for me, has been a, a new learning experience and being able to apply it on uh, future things for sure. Um, nice. So I, one of the biggest things that, that I've learned um, in the production of uh, Doom Eternal is actually something Hugo has touched upon when I was presenting my Erdex stuff is the importance of the mood boards. Um, that's where like I would start. Like anytime a, a concept assignment is handed to me now, I would always start with, with a mood board, like a bunch of references, um, basically just showing like the direction that I want to take that concept before even starting with my thumbnails, because it, it is pointless for you to start drawing and, and you're coming up with all these ideas, but that's not the direction that your game director or art director wants to take. So getting a reference board maybe takes you like a couple hours. And once you have that, you, you could show, show it to the team, show it to your, your game director. And he says, yes, this, this feels like what I want for this whatever concept that you're doing. And that saves so much time in, in the long run because I have definitely started assignment without doing that. So we were just going all over the place. And I think the Marauder was a good example. You, you see like me pretty much trying everything, right? I, I'm, I'm tossing all sorts of ideas. Whereas if I started with a mood board with that assignment, I think we would have arrived at the final way faster. else uh just to go off of the idea of mood boards i think that, that's um, one thing i've kind of realized lately um about mood boards is like when you when you get like a really specific assignment and then you start putting your mood boards together um the mood board itself kind of like uh i don't know it like creates like a narrative or a story and it has a like a logic to it if you pick like the images that seem to like work to the assignment you're doing. And then earlier on, I would just like gather just random images I thought were cool. And, and when I would put them together, you look at them and it's just like, it didn't really make sense. And so now like when I try to keep in mind, like when you put them together, just I realize like looking at like the, uh, the more advanced guys like Emerson or John's mood boards, like when he puts them together, um, you can clearly see like a, a story or like a, a visual motif being played out and then that that's like a that, that that's like a a lifesaver like for down the down the line as you keep working because like um yeah if you have like random images that are cool but you put them together and it doesn't really make sense you know you you'll you'll kind of be all over the place so you really want like a just like a logic 
and, and just like a, a narrative at, at the beginning to help guide you um, in the process. Uh, I just think working at a place like it, it exposes you to like lots of different processes and ways of thinking and how to approach a problem. So it's kind of like you're seeing how other guys are thinking. It, you can like add to your arsenal of like ways you would approach a problem. Like Colin approaches it this way. I'll approach it that way. Emerson approaches it this way. I'll tackle it this way. Um, that and just each studio I've worked at the, the quality, the bar for like where you need to be gets higher. And it just like, you're just like, oh, I got to up, up my game. So it's just, <laughs> I'm with these awesome guys. So if you ever have the opportunity to work with like a team like this, you got to take it. It's like, it's just, yeah, it makes you a better artist. Nice. All right. Well, I think this pretty much wraps it up for us. I wanted to, um, Hugo, I wanted to see if you had any final words for everyone. I'm muted. Sorry. Uh, no, I, it's, uh, I love, I love looking at this stuff myself. I think that, um, yeah, I just can't say it enough. It's a huge part of the process and I'm, I'm really, uh, I just admire the work that these guys do. It inspires me personally and uh, it informs a, a ton of stuff uh, in the game. And uh, it's exciting to see people develop creatively and artistically, which I feel like everybody at it is doing all the time. And, um, you know, uh, this is just one step in, in a pretty long process and you know then it goes off to the modelers and and um and there's a fair amount of interpretation that takes place so it's like every step of the way you want to make sure that you have people who are just excellent craftsmen and 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 really comfortable uh you know with with their technique and and their execution and their process uh and you're going to end up with a really good product uh in the end and and also i think that um what you hear here is it's just very collaborative. I mean, that's, that's the thing. Like we're all, we're all part of a team. So, I mean, you have to be able to um, push your ideas around and cause they are going to go off to different places. And sometimes you work with your coworkers to, to develop them further. Sometimes you'll, you'll nail it right away. It, it really doesn't matter. There's no set path. Uh, all that matters in the end is that the work is, is, is strong. Um, and, and that's, what's good for the game. So I think that, uh, it's just the, the artwork that was created for this is tremendous. I mean, it's, it's really just an amazing art book Definitely. and, and I'm, I'm just really proud of the guys. I think they did uh, just a, an amazing job. Yeah. The game is, is better for it. Yeah. 